Hey, welcome back. We're going to keep coding our Livingston Builders LLC. Wow, they should pay me for that. Uh, website. Uh, thanks to Mike G's submission. Just a quick reminder, um, I actually made the first set of videos live today. So go make sure you, well, you're already on the channel, but if you aren't and you got here somewhere else, check out our channel. And if you have your own submission, make sure you send it to me. You can find information in the About section about the rules and where to send it. Um, but for now, let's keep let's keep rocking. So where we left off was we did a basic data structure in the API section, and I told you that I was going to build this out a little bit, so we had some stuff to work with. Um, I would suggest you making sure you have your own similar structure before you continue um, through this video. Um, but for now, what we have to do is we have to code up the front end that's going to hook up to this and display the images in the way that we want them to. So um, when Mike sent this to me, he requested that the categories display and be clickable. So we're going to kind of aim for that. Um, right now, what this website looks like is as follows. No particular section is here. So first, we'll just kind of mirror this and then see what we can get uh, including the categories and see what else we can get for, for kind of free. So uh, let's let's get started. Um, so if we go into our client source routes. Um, oh my god, it's not doing the babble thing again. I hate it. Um, okay, so the blog is currently rendering the generic error page. We need to make a new page. So let's go to pages. We'll make a new file. I'm going to call it, I guess we'll just call it the same thing. Even though it's not really a blog. Let's just call it a blog. Uh, we'll call it blog. Uh, and it's going to need uh, our, oh, our navbar's in the layout, so never mind. So it's going to look kind of similar to the home section. It's also not babbling. That's very frustrating. Um, so it's going to need something similar to this home section. We're not going to need uh, anything here. That's not at all necessary. Um, so we can keep this. We don't need React styling. We don't need title. And instead of home.sass, we'll use blog.sass. We also want to make a new file called blog.sass. Um, right now, there's nothing in it. That's fine. We'll do our CX thing. Default class is blog. And I'm going to consolidate this stuff here a little bit. We'll put the return statement and the markup all in one. So it looks like that for now. A little bit neater. Uh, and you can keep using sections, that's fine. Um, a good convention for class names is to like name your component the top level at least. What's going on? The top level. <laughs> If I type a little funny, I may be drinking an adult beverage. Uh, the top level, at least, uh, the same as the file name. So, like this. Uh, that's a good idea. All right, cool. So, now what do we need to do? So, the first thing we're going to need to do is, and this is where we're going to integrate Redux into our application. Um, so, a quick primer on Redux, um, in case you don't know. Um, the way that you used to pass data around React is, let's pretend that this blog rendered a child div or like a child called my component. And the way that React used to work is you could pass this prop. So like if my component relied on some data and you had a, var a variable called some data, you would pass it as such. But the problem is that if this changes in this component and this component here that you're rendering also renders some child components that rely on pieces of that data too. You have to make sure that you pass it down through each one and actually it really just screws everything up, especially if you want to then update this data. It doesn't doesn't really make sense. So that was many directional data flow and what, Re and what Redux does is pulls all of this up into the top level. So if you imagine you have some data store for your entire application that lives at the global scale some data doesn't live here anymore and instead what you do is you connect to it. The way that you connect to it is like this. 
I can do this from memory the first time, by the way. Somebody owes me a cookie. Oopsie. So you connect to the global state using the connect method from React Redux, and you assign a ah, uh, you assign a prop to this component that corresponds to your data. So in this case, that prop is may very well be photos, and it's going to be state dot. Now we have to figure out the name of a substore, so we could say, let's just call it photos. And I think what our photos store is gonna look like, and this is usually a good idea, is if you have like multiple entries for photos, you might wanna include like photos.items, right? So in the global state, under the photos object, in the items sublevel, that's where all your actual photos are gonna be. And then in your render method, you say const, Use the deconstructor like such. It makes life easier. This dot props. Okay. So this dot props dot photos. This deconstructs it into the photos thing. So you can actually just pass photos like such. And we're actually going to do something different in the component that this will render probably. Um, we'll save that for the next video. Um, so now we can access our photos from our Redux store, like such. Now you might ask the question, all right, so how do we get the photos in there? So that, we're gonna handle that in this component as well. And this is why I love React so much, it's because the components can dictate how they handle their own data, um, or how they, when they go and fetch it, how they go and fetch it, that sort of thing. So we're going to use one of the React lifecycle methods, component did mount, and this one doesn't need any argument and what component did mount is going to do is it's going to call a redux action so uh, I guess we'll call uh, this dot props that get photos and we also have to import that from our store of redux actions so import let's see get photos from, and it's going to be up one in Redux, photos, like such. So we have to create this file too in our Redux area. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave this here for now, we'll come back and explain it in a little bit. Um, but basically what we need is we need this method. Um, we also have to do something in the connect method to get to it, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. Let's go into our Redux folder real quick. Um, so right now they have some samples. They have users, leave preload. They have simpler Redux form stuff. We'll not worry about that right now. Um, and the users shows how a little sample of how they want to have this work. So I'm actually gonna copy this whole thing. I'm gonna create a new file in the Redux folder. I'm gonna call it photos.js, and I'm gonna paste this. And actually, we only need the get function. We don't need to add, we don't need to delete right now, so we're just gonna get rid of that. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right, so it's exporting the function get users. And notice the underscore case in here, so we need to have it be get photos. Namespace can be photos. Event can be get photos. Hmm, I'm not really sure how this part works. I guess it could be... Hmm, let's do underscore for now. If it doesn't work, we'll come back. All right, uh, don't worry about these two things just yet. Um, let's just get you through the basics. So there's like a lot of crap that goes on here that we don't need to worry about right now. Um, so get photos. Uh, and then the action that it does, and this is where what you're going to do is you're going to call your database. So what they do in this sample application is they delay for a second to simulate a database call because all your stuff is local so it's going to be instant and then they say and once again why is this so funny looking oh my god uh, and then they say uh, user IDs is await http.get and then your API endpoint so if you remember from the last video we set this API endpoint up to be slash images right we set that up in the API uh, resources section. So what this is going to do is we're going to just instead of 
Wait, what are we looking at? Uh, not this. That's the user one. Oh, uh, instead of API example users, we're just going to say API photos. And we'll say this is photos. And uh, actually, we can get rid of this part because we're not doing this. And we'll just return the result of http.get. If you're confused by this await syntax, it's just like waiting for the result, res blah, 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 the resolution of a promise. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. You're basically just waiting for this to finish. Um, and you can use this because this is an async function. So don't worry about that, though. Not important. OK, result is what happens once this returns. So in result, the result method takes the state and the actual result. Um, I don't like to do this part because, generally speaking, you need to do some data transformation. However, in this particular case, we don't really need to because we know that this is going to be items, and we know the structure of our results already um, because we wrote it. Duh. Uh, of course, I don't remember what it looks like. Um, find then it just returns it. Uh, I think it's result.data.items is what we want. But, of course, uh, I can't remember. And I can't find where we put it. Where do we put it? Here? Where is this? Oh, resources. No. Uh, so this whole thing is results.data.items is what we want. So that's what we need to say in our Redux action. Result.data.items. So this will take whatever is returned by this right here, which is whatever is returned by this, which is this. Um, we're actually delaying on the back end too, so we don't need to await here. Um, this will take that and pipe it through this result function. And we already know that result.data.items is what we're after, so we're going to put it here. And that's it. That's all you have to do. We did most of the work last time. Um, the only other thing I would do is make sure you handle this initial state over here. You're not going to want it to be users. We know that our prop is going to be items. And maybe we'll have some other stuff in the future, like current category, which for now can be a blank string. We'll get to that later. All right. Once you're done with your action reducer here, you need to include it in the big reducer. So if you go into your client, and you go to your reducer.js, you'll notice this is in users, and we're going to go ahead and get the same thing from photos. And uh, let's stick with a convention here and keep everything lowercase. All right, so let's recap what we just did, because phew, it was a lot. Um, none of this part matters what we did in the front end yet, because what we did in our Redux store is we set up an action called getPhotos that calls the API endpoint that we wrote last time. That endpoint returns through this, which puts a copy of this object into the store, the Redux store, the global data store for the application, using the structure described here. And that's exactly what we want. We want result.data.items from the return here into the store as the items prop. Phew. Okay. Hold on. Have to take a sip. Okay. I hope you're good. You're good. <laughs> I've decided for you. All right. The last thing we have to do is in our blog component here is we just have to connect this get photos function like such. And then finally, we want to make sure that we declare some prop types. Uh, we also have to import prop types. So we know that photos is, that's FOTS. What is FOTS? It is prop types dot array of prop types object. And get photos is a function. This is just some similar to TypeScript. Just some uh, stuff to help ease readability. All right, so we're done with this component now. And before we render anything, I'm just going to log what photos is. 
and we don't actually have anything called my components. We'll delete that for a second and render hello world. All right, so let's recap what this does. Here's some imports, doing our class names thing. What connect does is it takes what's in the global Redux store and maps it to specific props in this one component. So we're going to take state dot lowercase p, state dot photos dot items, and map it to the photos prop in this component. And we're also going to take the get photos object, excuse me, function, and turn it into a Redux action through some magic that goes on in this system. We're going to declare some prop types so we know what we're working with. Photos is an array. Get photos is a function. When the component mounts, which means after it's put onto the DOM and onto the page, we're going to go ahead and call get photos. Just a side note, you can look up more of these lifecycle methods if you like on the official React documentation. I suggest you get familiar with them. They're wonderful. And last but certainly not least, we're going to render this stuff, which is basically nothing right now because we don't even know if it worked or not. Whew. Hope you're okay. That's what we did. All that's left to do is in our routes, go ahead and set up this component to be rendered. And if this changes back from Babel one more time, I'm gonna flip shit. Uh, import, uh, what was it, blog, blog, from pages, blog, and then instead of error, blog. That's it. Did we get any, comp wow, no compilation errors. We're very good at this. <laughs> All right, let's go to localhost. See what happens. Photos, cool. Well, nothing broke yet. Let's check out what console.log logged. Aha! What do we get? Hmm. Looks like. Get photos was not found. Oh, you know what? No, no. You know what? Maybe we uh, set up our endpoint wrong. Let's just check this out. API. Maybe you can't do this. Let's just try getting rid of the example API real quick. I remember we set that up as an array, thinking that we could do that, and maybe we just can't. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It was prefixed by API. Example users, API.get images. Yeah, sure, why not? Let's try again. Didn't like it. Um, so obviously we can see the problem is that it's not finding that photo though because that's called images. Wow. <laughs> oh, don't drink beer and coke, friends. <laughs> uh, images. <sighs> ah, there we go. Uh, well, you know, sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. Uh, but sure enough, there's our array of images exactly the way we want it. So that is wonderful. And uh, what we need to do next is figure out a way to render this. So I'm going to do a basic quick render, and then in the next video we'll come back and we're going to fine tune it. When I say basic quick render, what I mean is we're just going to put a bunch of images on the page uh, in, in a little wrapper. So the last one used Bootstrap for these. Um, so we can do something fairly similar. I'm going to kind of close all my windows here. We don't need them anymore except the blog CSS. Cool. All right. So how to properly render an array. We're going to use conditional rendering, which is just saying if, this is like shorthand if statement. So if the length of photos is greater than zero, let's map it. And what map does is it loops through each object in the photos array, sets it as a variable that you decide, and then we're going to return some data structure. So we'll do that in the next line. Um, and essentially, we have to be returning something like so. 
Okay. All right, so what are we going to return? I think for the photos, when we're, ju we're just worried about the photos for now. We'll give them a little wrapper, and we'll say that the class name for this is photo wrapper. And inside each photo, we'll put an image whose source is going to be something like photo dot, what's the prop? Photo.url. And we should give it some alt text too. So, eh, forget about it. Let's get the alt text. All right, also in React, all the keys, all the uh, parent divs, parent containers in an array map need a key. So we're going to say the key is also equal to the photo.url because that'll be unique. Um, you shouldn't use the index uh, as the array key. It screws up performance, especially when you're having a lot of photos on the page like we will in matters. Um, okay. So, of course, this URL is not complete. We need to add our Cloudinary uh, stuff in the beginning. So if you remember from our construction of the home thing, this is what the beginning kind of... Oh, my God, it unbabbled again. This is what the beginning looked like. And then we added some image transforms, which we will do for this, but we're going to skip for now. And then the rest of the URL. So I'm going to copy this source property here just so we could see it. And we're going to go ahead and modify it just slightly. All right, so instead of scaling to width 1280, you'll notice that in the original, they were kind of, well, you'll notice nothing about the original because <laughs> it's not open. Uh, better. You'll notice that they were about this wide. So this is about, you know, 600 pixels. So we'll scale them to 700 just to be sure. And then instead of this, that's where we need to put our photo.url. So we'll use a string template here. String templates are a great ES6 thing. A little bit more readability. And what this is like doing, this is like saying string plus photo.url. That's what this syntax is doing. Um, but it just makes it a little bit nicer to read. Uh, and that's actually it. That's all we even have to do. Um, which seems absolutely crazy, but sure enough, if we Go ahead and render it. We will see that <laughs> we have screwed ourselves up. What did we do? I think I forgot a parentheses on map. Did I return? Do I have? I guess I don't need a semicolon. I do not. So we got every picture on the page. That's good. They're a little bit wide. Let's continue to scale them down. We'll say uh, 600. A little bit better. All right. Um, so that's great. Let's go ahead and go into our SAS. So blog is the top level. And then photo wrapper is the next one. And then image is inside photo wrapper. So we know that the image needs to be 100% of its width. The photo wrappers, though, this is where it gets a little interesting. So we know that uh, we'll just handle desktop screens for now. What do they do on mobile? All right, so on mobile, it's just one. So what we can say is we can do the width is 100%. Add, uh, I can never remember the media query syntax. Never remember it. Incredible. So when the uh, screen is at a min width, uh, I think it's, uh, what is it, 762? 992? No, we want, it, we want it this way on tablet, too. Or do we? I don't know. We'll say 992 pixels. The width is going to be 25%. Why is this plain text? Do I need? I think I need a SAS. I need a SAS plugin too. We'll do that later. Um, 
Okay, so if the screen is at least 992 pixels, the width of these wrappers will be a quarter of it, so we can get four. And we're also going to want to put some padding so there's a nice little bar of spacing. And we'll be padding on all sides. Um, although I think the left and right pad, no, 10 pixels. Let's see what happens. And we also need them to be display inline blocks so they line up next to each other. And I always like to vertical align top by default on my inline blocks because Otherwise, you can get some funny things with them not being in alignment. Um, and these are also perfectly square, too, which is interesting. So what we're going to want to do is uh, figure out how to handle that. I think on mobile it doesn't matter. We can leave them how they are. However, here, what we're going to have to do is set their height to be 25 view height. Or we can just give them all the same height. Um, because they don't necessarily have to be square. Um, it's kind of interesting how to do this. Uh, most of the time, what you would do here is you would make sure that your images are the same height. Oh, if only we had a system that could do that. <laughs> Thanks, Cloudinary. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, God, I love Cloudinary. All right, let's leave it like that. <laughs> Um, Cloudinary can transform it for us like this. Uh, I'm not sure if you can do both at the same time. We'll see what happens. But let's go ahead and save. And ooh, very neat, very neat. Almost there. It looks like we have some padding. It's kind of screwing us up. Oh, you know what else we need to do? We need to do border box um, so that this and padding play nicely together. So let's see, where can we edit the main style for the whole thing? I think it's layout. I'm going to use the wildcard in layout. So everything uses border box. There we go. And uh, as you can see, Cloudinary does its job masterfully, um, scaling every picture to the right size. It looks like the background we're not getting quite correct here. So it's not quite snug up against it. Let's go ahead into blog, add a background color. What color is this? <laughs> I don't know what that noise was, don't ask. Uh, it looks like it's just off white. So we'll use the same color that we have in the nav bar. What we should actually do is set up a SAS variable for this, but we're lazy right now and we're not going to do that because um, we got to get stuff done. we got to do things. Fa, fa. Fa, fa, fa is the color. Fa, fa, fa. See how that does it? Very nice. Uh, okay. Do we want to keep this padding for section? I don't really know. I think not. Let's make the padding left be a little bit less or none. Mm -hmm. Let's see how this works. Looks a little bit better. All right, so that's what it looks like on desktop. And how about mobile? Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. But our image gallery is scrumptious. Lots of padding underneath, though. Yeah, see, it's getting double padding underneath. So what we have to do on these is because on mobile, interesting. So on mobile, <coughs> there's double padding underneath. Padding on the top is fine. So we'll say padding bottom five, padding top is five. But on non-mobile, we actually want it to be 10. That fixes the double padding issue here. And does it still look good? Oh, what is that? we need to get our desktop version in here. Laptop with HD and MD. Do I have to save? I don't even know. Nope. Ah. Great. Cool. So we got all our pictures. 
and uh, we got them in a pretty quick and dirty render, which I'm fine with. I hope you are too. Um, so that's good for now. That's great. Um, so let's just recap again how we did this in the front end area. So we took our photos, which we now know are the correct data structure. We know how to map to them. We made sure that their length is greater than zero, and then we mapped. This is the correct way to render stuff out of an array. Use a map. Each item is called a photo, and then we're returning some markup for each photo. We're going to return a top layer div keyed by each photo's URL, class name photo wrapper, and then we'll construct our cloudinary URL using that photo path. What we're going to do in the next video is go through some advanced tricks. What I might do if I was preparing this particular component for production. Um, we're going to go through some more advanced tricks that, you know, if this is your first time using React, honestly, you might you might just skip it. Um, but I'm going to make a quick video of how to how I might change this around a little bit. Um, if you do come back uh, and see the next video where we'll add clickable category titles, this might look different, but I promise you whatever we do will still work the same way for your version as well. Um, but that's enough for now. So, hope you enjoyed, and see you next time.